So what was the this community like then? And I have to say, slightly more interesting to me, what were you like then? Oh, well. Thank you, John. That, that might be for others to say. <laughs> the, the first time I came along to the community, it was meeting on Northway in that church hall, and it'd be going maybe a couple of years, and I was a student at Cambridge, and somebody told me about it, and I came along with my then girlfriend, who had the wit to marry United Synagogue Sachsen afterwards, <laughs> and um, I really liked I really liked the community, and the community. You know, I must express my gratitude. I want to express my gratitude. The community built me. Um, not long afterwards, when I finished at, at Cambridge, I spent a year in Israel, and I thought I wanted to study forestry, and I got a place for a master's at Oxford in forestry management, and a place meant with Karen Kayemet. Hated it, um, <laughs> and ended up teaching, which I loved. Came back, began to work for this community as a youth leader, and that gradually built up, and a little bit of laning, and a bit of speaking, and a bit of teaching, and I found myself, a, you know, a student rabbi being encouraged by the community. I hope the particular person who encouraged me doesn't regret it um, to study at Lowbeck College, and at that time. I think the fact that the rabbinet was in my blood, from both sides, came out. And I remember I must have been a pain in the neck in my first year at Lever College because I was full of doubt uh, about it. I instinctively realised that being a community rabbi absorbed one's time. And I thought, will I have time to write? Will I have time to war? They were wrong about that, they, but they were right about the rabbinet. And, uh, it was about sometime in my second year as a student that I stopped looking back and never seriously regretted it. And I stopped asking the questions and found that I was being asked the questions. The challenge came the other way. And then when I completed my studies at Lerbeck, I was offered a full-time position in this congregation. That was 1987. So just say something about it being in your blood. Ah, well, the bit I knew was that my mother's father, this guy's here, I think, somewhere, um, Rabbi Georg Salzberger, had been Rabbi in Frankfurt am Main, and then when they fled to London, he founded the Belsize Square Synagogue. Now, they lived in Hodford Road, round the corner. My brother and I used to go there not less than three or four times a week. In fact, the bet as we walked along was we would count the paving stones and we would guess, would it be 707 or 710? We were never more than three out. But listening to my grandfather, and particularly the last year of his life, I was 17, 18, often went there from school. They were quite weak, my grandparents. They enjoyed being read to. I enjoyed practicing my German by reading German to them. But I also had understood something of my grandfather's vocation and I could ask him questions. And I remember asking, you know, I remember him saying to me, I, I was looking at, he had the Goldschmidt edition of the Talmud, the German translation, hugely thick tomes. And I asked him about it and he said, I remember this, you know, it takes a particular sharpness of mind and skill to study Talmud. And I remember going home in that night thinking, well, if this is my heritage, who, am I, who else should I be leaving this to? It was really much, much later, too late, that I appreciated that my father's side had a rabbinical line, if anything, a stronger one, that my father's mother was the daughter of a, a whole lineage of Orthodox rabbis in Central Europe. And in fact, it's, it's really been the last few years of my life that I've been researching that chain and he was, he, 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 he was sparing How did you, how did you not know that already? I knew it, but I didn't know it. I didn't really take it in because my grandfather, my father's father died before my brother was born, and my grandmother lived in Jerusalem, so I saw her maybe three times. We weren't as close to that side of the family, but if I think about the impact now, it, it subliminally, it reached me. And the one line was liberal, and the other line was orthodox. So when they crossbred, it came out with salty. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that, I want to know about this forestry management thing a moment, because were you, 
I mean, in a way, I could say, you know, were you serious? I mean, we, 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 given your lineage on both sides, it does feel like you were destined to be a rabbi. That was just always going to happen. So did you, on some level, know that that's what you were going to do, even when you were going through the motions of pretending you were going to be a forester, whatever they actually do? Um, <laughs> This is a Jewish audience. Nobody knows what forestry is. <laughs> uh, but you know, so how serious were you about, um, you know, pretend? Were you, were you on some level pretending to yourself in a way that people sometimes do run away from their destiny? Did you really know, actually, of course, I'm actually going to be a rabbi? No, I didn't. Um, I had spent a month when my grandfather died. It was kind of in testament to him attending courses at Lerbeck College. So I had thought about it, but I didn't know. And in fact, I just in thinking of where my children are at in their lives, I found the years between the age of 20 and maybe 25 the most difficult because the railway lines that led from school through to university, suddenly they, they, there was the end. And what happens next? And I think now it's even more difficult for young people because there's, there's even less clarity. And I've always loved nature and I've always loved trees. I kind of... There's a bit of adjunct forestry management in, right outside the door there, which Brian knows well about. Um, and I was, uh, I, I mean, I probably was fooling myself at some level, but I wasn't consciously running away from what I knew I would end up doing. And they were years of searching, and I found them, I found them hard. Um, it wasn't, I didn't have an inner certainty of vocation. And it's the honest truth that I feel that I've been built and shaped by the work of a community rabbi. So that now, in those times which are, you know, there are, there are moments when I get fed up with it and moan to myself, um, but most of the time, I feel passionately about it. You, you made a joke about the sort of genetic inheritance that you were destined to be a Masorti rabbi with the liberal and orthodox roots. But just what about that? I mean, did you go through, in a way, maybe it wasn't in a sequence that once you decided to be a rabbi and then you thought about what kind of rabbi, but just your own journey to Masorti Judaism, was that always going to be a done deal too? Or did you, as some people do early on in their life, they flirt with other strands. I mean, for other people, it would be moving away from Judaism altogether, I don't know, Buddhism or something, but, did, but in your case, the, the kind of Judaism that you are, in some ways in Britain now, the absolute sort of embodiment of the sort of Judaism, was that always foretold? From within my Judaism, I had no doubts about that, and that was the other huge influence, which is when we moved down to London, the family joined the New London Synagogue with Rabbi Dr. Louis Jacobs, and I was a boy of six, and I grew up in that shul, I you know, all the way through, I became more involved at university when the Jewish society was really my, my home from home. Talking about forestry management, my role was to manage the gardens there and then to manage the equipment in the kitchen, which always broke down on Friday mornings. I don't know why, but it always, it, it, it always did. And that made me more intensely observant. And so I became a sort of ortho, liberal orthoprax but the Masorti ideology of understanding the Torah as a human text, that basis for intellect, for the, the intellectual basis for Masorti Judaism, I never really doubted that that's where I belonged. Reform Judaism, I have a lot of affection and a lot of respect for colleagues and for the social action it's involved with. Mm -hmm. It was never me liturgically or in terms of practice. And I think I could be a congregant in Orthodox synagogues at the back of the shul and enjoy it, but I couldn't be a rabbi. And in fact... What, because when, you would feel hypocritical or something? I, I just couldn't embrace the doctrine. I would have been fired after, <laughs> after sermon number one. But, but, but I, love, I love Hasidic prayer, and I used to go... I, in the end, in this year in Israel, I finished up teaching some of the week and staying with distant relatives, very elderly, who needed a lot of care. And the key thing I had to do was to walk with a gentleman who was developing, and I realized, dementia, to the synagogue in Share Chesed. And I was the only one not wearing black in that shul. And um, it was a wonderful experience. We'd have Kabbalah Shabbat, and then there'd be a pause while the Sidra was taught in Yiddish, and then the Shamas would come on the desk, for Baruch Hu, and the first time he did, I fell off the bench. I just didn't know what was 
<laughs> happening. And at first I found it alien, and then I decided that I, I loved it. But this came to a rapid end when Nikki and I met, and I took her there. And I realized the experience for women was to be in a cage, <laughs> a long way away from, well, in a cage, really. And in fact, we then went to Sput for a weekend, and it was an even smaller cage, as Nikki said. <laughs> and into this cage, some young Hasidic boys introduced to rather annoy Nikki three puppies in the middle of the service, which had, I think, a rather different effect. Um, but I realized this is also not on to be in this men-only world if you're not a man only. Mm. And that this wasn't going to work for, you know, for family. It was a, a strain of me that I, and I still feel we want a Masorti Hasidut, that passion of prayer. But ideologically, I never doubt it. And I, I, I feel that, in a way, I trained for the rabbinate with this community in mind, and it stayed that way. Mm. So you just give us something about this community, because you mentioned that once, and the um, and meeting there, not here. Uh, you know, now it's a big, thriving community with this fantastic building, and you know, I don't know how many members there are here, but I think it's a, it's a, it's a 1,500, 2,000, I don't know, a huge number. But then what was it like? And um, people have an image, in some ways maybe it's a slightly um, idealised image of it being very sort of pioneering, and it was eight people in someone's front room. But uh, actually describe for us a little bit of what it was that you walked into. Well, I remember, I, I remember the first service we had in what is now our old building. And I remember the team getting together with buckets and cloths to wash it down. There was a question, seeing it had been a convent, of what a Jewish community does with the cross. You know, does it need a gneezer um, um, or, or, or not? And I remember the opening service, and, and I would have said at that point there were maybe 200 people in, in the community. It wasn't tiny anymore. And I, I think the growth of a synagogue has a lot to do with the chemistry of its founding group. And this founding group had a chemistry of openness, engagement with people, but an increasing depth of commitment to being self-taught in their Judaism. They also, and I think Guy Jacobs and Michael Rose, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of credit for this, had created a constitution in which there was going to be steady change of leadership. And that meant that it was a structure capable of development and evolution. And if I look over the years, there are, I think, two very significant moments that have helped the future of this synagogue. Mm. Both of them were tricky. One was the beginning of the first egalitarian service. Half recognized, grudgingly so at that time, by the rest of the community. Hakololin, down in the basement next door. But it was written in the constitution that we should let them have a Sefer Torah. How nice of us. <laughs> um, now the opportunity that gave for more people to find themselves Jewishly has had an immense impact on people's capacity to learn and be involved. And the other was less contentious, but not dissimilar. It was a group of younger people coming along, many motivated by Limud. That's the group that brought Claire, Mark Soloway, Jeremy Gordon, Zahavi Chaleb, all people who have a key role in Jewish life now. They were then in their 20s, touching 30, created a chavura, and I have to say I worked quite hard to engage them with this community because I saw there a huge energy and love of learning that was going to contribute to our future. Those, in, terms of, in terms of the religious life, there's also the educational life, the social life, and there's a lot of people to be grateful for, but those were key things. Yeah. And you said that people were a bit wary, particularly of the first thing, the egalitarian. And I mean, one of the things that people often don't think about or talk about out loud about a rabbi is spiritual leadership and leading people through life cycle events. And I want to ask you something about that in a moment. But there is also quite a lot of politics involved in being a communal rabbi. And, you know, it's, it's hard work. There are groups and different, uh, I hesitate to use the word factions, but there will be some people who want this and some people who want that. Everybody who knows you, Jonathan, knows you as somebody who's a very conciliatory person, non-confrontational person, gentle person, and yet to be leader of community like this for 30 years would have required you to have actually 
gone through some sort of tough meetings, some tough battles with people. I mean, just tell us about how you've navigated through that, because this community won't be different from all the other Jewish communities there are. I'm not sure we ever really know. Um, <laughs> I've you know, developed a couple of uh, a couple of two or three sayings which help in moments of stress. One is I heard from a friend of the family, Shakan Asom Mishugas. You know, just allow it, let it, let it be. Another for stressful moments is if you can't go to synagogue for the spiritual uplift, you can usually go for the social comedy. Um, but the third one is the one that's really mattered to me, which is sometimes you come to barriers and you can't go over them and you don't know how to go around them, but you can usually go under them. And somehow, I suppose what I mean by that is that people want to find ways of accommodating the things. And people have a lot of goodwill to be drawn on. And they're bonds of affection that one could work with. Where there have been very, I don't think there have been real disagreements in this community, where there haven't been bonds of affection at the same time to draw on, to say, there are differences here. These and these are the words of the living God, to quote the Talmud, and we care for each other. So let's see how we can do this well, and, and thoughtfully, and graciously. For myself, I've also borne in mind, and I, I, it's a huge challenge, and I don't think I've always managed this as well, with every person, sometimes I think, God forbid, what if they were to have a family tragedy, and I had to go around to their house, I wouldn't want to be a person they felt they didn't want to talk to. Now, I don't think I've always succeeded there, but that really matters. I can, I'm just now thinking of the Jewish communities where the rabbi, someone, no one's talking to. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they exist. Um, you mentioned the egalitarian um, innovation. I mean, I'm, I'm guessing that would have been perhaps the most sort of controversial issue in this community. There's obviously been a debate recently about same-sex partnerships and marriages. Looking back over the three decades, I mean, what, what was the most sort of challenging issue for you as the leader of this community? One challenging issue I managed to miss by being in Israel at the time, where that was, that was the kosher, known as the kosher biscuit row, about the, the kosher policy of the synagogue and whether people should be allowed to cook at home under guidance and bring things in. And I'm actually totally with my colleague Rabbi Chaim Wiener, who, you know, just, uh, I, I should mention this, we've worked together now for 20 years, and the partnership has sometimes been, you know, when Rabbi Wiener left Edgware Masorti, we joked from the platform that we probably talked to each other more than each of us talked to our wives some days, and I think the two of them looked at each other at that moment because there was laughter I couldn't really quite explain. <laughs> and then Chaim was in Israel, it was a bit more distant, but then you know, when Chaim and Judy moved around the corner, and also I want to say how I value the, the love of halacha, which is an absolute grounding, defining feature of the community, and it needs to be developed further. So I've lost it for a bit. But now the egalitarian, yes, it probably has been the biggest, the biggest issue for the community. We're lucky that we're a community big enough to be pluralist, so that people can have different services and float between them sometimes. There are very, very few people who don't go to their friend's simcha in another service. And I think people have appreciated, well, this isn't for me, but I'm glad it's part of my community. And pluralism, from being a word people were suspicious of sometimes, has become a, a word that I think much of the community is proud of. It doesn't mean that there aren't tensions. And in a way, I haven't seen it as my role to decide for the community what comes next. I think it's my role to help facilitate the natural development of the Jewish life of the community and to try and ensure, ensure, together with what has been excellent lay leadership, that it's fair. On a personal note, it is very clear to me 
to understand why egalitarianism matters. In a world where people would find it an outrage if a woman was paid less for exactly the same job, I understand that people, especially younger generations, think that religion should reflect the same principle of equality. But I also understand that one of the things we look for in our religious life, which isn't about, <coughs> religious life is not about change primarily, it's about stability, it's about association with the past, that for a Jewish tradition which for 2,000 years has not been egalitarian, people see their authenticity in terms of what their elders did. And for many people that's profoundly important. And so I feel comfortable, there are people who tell me I shouldn't, but I feel comfortable in this community's egalitarian services and I feel comfortable in its not egalitarian services. And I haven't want to conduct myself in such a way as would diminish the authentic that would be cruel and wrong.